Welcome to the International Teacher Podcast with your host, Matt the Family Guy, Kent the Cat Guy, Jacqueline from JP Mint, and Greg the Single Guy, bringing you episodes from around the world about the best kept secret in education. You've got it, international teaching. Welcome to the show. This is Greg the Single Guy coming at you from the ITP, the International Teacher Podcast. So I would like to introduce a wonderful guest that's going to give us a little bit different point of view. Anna is coming to us from Sri Lanka. She is a psychologist, and she's going to offer a few things that we've never really gone down before. I can't wait to delve into this topic. She's support for international teachers. So if you're listening to this and you've never even thought about support as an international teacher, let's get into the meat of the act. Welcome to the show, Anna from Sri Lanka. Thank you so much for having me, Greg. I'm so excited because Anna just told me she's also done live radio, so I'm going to sound really bad compared to her on um, live. <laughs> <laughs> I'm retired now. I hung up my headphones a long time ago. I hear you. Hey, you know what? Let's start the show and give us some background, how you relate to international teaching and what your journey was getting up to what you're doing now. So can you start off like from Ireland, I believe? Yeah, absolutely. So... I became a primary school teacher um, I, and I worked in the UK for about four years. I love the, the way that you guys say this, that international teaching is the best kept secret in education. So about 10 years ago, my now husband, but then boyfriend, also were on that same train of thought of, hey, international teaching, we've heard amazing things about this. We have to do it. Let's go. And of course, I think like so many international teachers, you plan to go for two years and then it's six years later. So off we went to China. We started working in international baccalaureate schools. And then I made the brave move to leave teaching and go back to psychology because I had worked and educa- was educated in psychology before teaching. And... Yeah, went back, did my master's, set up my business, and then we moved to Sri Lanka. You've been in international schools, and you have actual experience with IB also. So can you give us a little rundown of some of what you taught and what your husband taught? Yeah, absolutely. So I worked in, in primary school, and I worked across several different grade levels in primary school. I never went down as young as the, the early years. I don't think I could do that. But I taught from grade one up to grade five. Um, and I was also a PYP coordinator for a few years during that time as well. And then my husband, David, is a design teacher. He teaches NYP and DP design. And just so our listeners know, that's the PYP you mentioned is the elementary version of the International Baccalaureate program that some schools have. That's right. And then the MYP is the middle years program. And then the IB is the diploma program which is for the high schools for the last two years. We haven't talked a lot about the IB program on here. You were a coordinator for PYP before, right? Yeah, I did that for a few years while we were still in China. We were in a few different schools in China, mainly in, well, we were in Suzhou, in Jiangsu, near Shanghai. Okay. Um, So we were in a couple of different schools there. And yeah, that's where I was coordinator for uh, the PYP program. So being a teacher and being overseas, is your husband still teaching? Yes, he teaches here in Sri Lanka. So that's what brought us specifically to Sri Lanka. And we're actually in the process of preparing for our next international move where we're off to Vietnam next. Hanoi. Are you really? Are you? What school can you tell us or is that secret? <laughs> no, Which... that's definitely not a secret. Uh, so uh, we're going to Eunice. The You're United going to Nations Eunice up in school. Hanoi. Yeah. Oh, yes. what a great established school that is. And your husband's got a job lined up. And you, on the other hand, you have designed something else. And you're tackling up a di- whole different picture on the side at, based on your experience. So tell us about what you do now and tell us what we're going to get into for the show. <laughs> I feel like I could take up hours of your time by just getting Please into do. this and it's telling recording. you the whole process. Yeah. <clears throat> So I, yes, left teaching um, and decided to go back to psychology and because psychology was my first love. I actually originally got into teaching because I wanted to pursue educational psychology. And that was my plan, you know, teach for two years, go back, do a doctorate. 
And then you start traveling and going international and all of that went out the window. Worked with students, work in the schools. I've worked in schools like in exactly. Kuwait. I worked with an educational psychologist. And right now I work with one or two and they're, they're wonderful. It's very difficult to do, but they're very sought after for schools. A lot of testing, a lot of things like that. But special needs is big right now, right? So you didn't decide to stick with that, though. Where, where did you go instead? So I found when I was working in the international schools and in leadership positions, I loved I loved working in leadership, but I loved working in staff development and people development. I loved working with people to build their confidence and build their leadership skills and build their teaching skills. And I really wanted to kind of pursue my interests in that a bit more, but outside of the school setting in essence. So I went back to psychology um, and really focused on psychology around well-being so positive psychology and coaching psychology and then at the end of my master's again because so much of my life and so much of the people around me are international teachers I focused on my research on teacher well-being and international teacher well-being and you can see there's huge gaps when it comes to international teacher well-being that I think in my opinion and what the research says it gets kind of overshadowed in a sense. So let me put it to you like this. As international teachers, we are working in the best kept secret in education, right? Correct. You get caught by, in essence, the golden handcuffs. You're on a great salary. You're probably better resourced than you were back in your state school or where you came from. You're financially better off. Most cases, you get your rent paid. (laughs) Yeah, hopefully (laughs) you are. Yeah, yeah. In most cases, you get your rent paid or you get benefits like your health insurance paid and uh, some contracts have flights. In some cases, you're getting even better holidays than your state schools, right? So it's a really good package. And you get, of course, amazing opportunities to meet new people and like-minded people. And there are so many positive things to it. But in that process as well, there are also quite negative aspects or what can damage your well-being okay if you think about it every time you take an international move you're taking a leap of faith you're changing and potentially losing the support systems that you had in some cases you make a leap and it was the wrong one or it's not fulfilling your needs or a lot of times in essence because of the golden handcuffs because the package is so good where you are and even though you're not happy you decide to stay and just suck it up And these are the aspects of international teacher well-being that I'm working within. I feel like I'm checking every box, you know, (laughs) but I've been overseas for like 20 some years. So I can see myself at different stages and it was never golden handcuffs until towards the end when I moved up in different schools. Right. And, And while you're talking negative stuff, I'm sure things like missing family comes up. There's, mm-hmm. there's things that, that people try to escape from their past, like from their home country. There might be financial things. There's financial burdens that they're trying to escape. There's probably relationship. Some people go off and flee a relationship and think it's this is going to make it okay. Mm-hmm. There are current relationships with their family or friends that go south, like that deteriorate when we leave. We're missing out on birthdays and friendships and weddings. And there's a ton of things that we're missing out on when we make that choice. And do those also fill up boxes that people are starting to talk to you about too? Oh, absolutely. And the thing with so much of this is that they're not clinical issues. So what I mean by that is they're not, they don't fall under clinical psychology in essence. They're not... You don't diagnose it's it. It's not that I'm... Yeah, you don't... But also, it's not um, an illness. You know, uh, it doesn't yes. fall under mental illness. Whereas the positive psychology aspect that I work on is building strengths and optimizing and improving your position. You don't have to wait until something becomes an illness in order to build mental health. Got it. So I'm not going in and sitting on the couch with you and saying, oh, my God, you know, I haven't been taking my meds and this and that and the other. It's not a diagnosed kind of thing. One of the teachers I taught with back in 2002, he said, living overseas, all the little things build up. And if you don't have a friend to talk to about it or your family member or someone close to talk about it, it's like getting pecked to death by ducks. Right. It's little itty bitty things. I'll never forget Jim's 
the quotation that you're getting pecked to death by ducks. And if you don't have some kind of outlet and don't realize that these things are happening, and they're not even all negative things either. Sometimes it's just the doorknobs are all different and you're not, you know, you're like, you have a bad day and you come home and that doorknob is different or the toilet seat is different or power goes out. You know, these are not diagnosed things. These are the little things that build up. And like you're saying, if, if we don't have an outlet for that, so you've identified that this, you see that this happens to a lot of teachers, and we don't always realize it happening, if I may, right? It sounds like you're hitting it right on the head, and there's not a lot of people that talk about this unless we bring it up between us. Exactly. And it's, I think it's one of those things that when you try to talk to people at home about it, people that are not international teachers, it's very hard to, for them at times to relate because... In essence, you're living the life that a lot of people want. You're traveling. You are probably doing well financially. And it's very hard to relate to the struggles of international life. Because the other answer is, well, you choose to do it. God, you're reading my mind. You're reading my (laughs) mind. That's exactly how I depict it. And for our listeners, it's not always greener on the other side. It's not always a Shangri-La. This is a difficult thing. It's not for everybody. Even the best of us, even those of us that have been out there for the longest time still go through stages of this. It sounds like you, you've identified these gaps. I I love the, that, that you've come on our show to talk about this because it's not like, I, I mean, maybe I do need help. I probably need lots of help. Kent would say, Matt would be like, Gr- Please, would you leave Greg on for another couple <laughs> hours and talk to him, please? Put him on your couch. He needs help. <laughs> um, so you've identified these gaps. How are you reaching out? How does it work with you? So all of my work um, is online at the moment, and I work one-on-one with clients in a coaching sphere. I think teachers can relate to the idea of coaching really well because coaching similar to teaching and learning it's it's not about me telling somebody what to do it's that facilitation of a journey and growth and a process through inquiry okay so every single client that I work with one-on-one is completely different and comes to me about something completely different of course there's there's trends you know I'll see a trend of say people that are burnt out I'll see another trend of people who um, are getting frustrated because they're not advancing their career the way they want to, or another group of people who are just, you know what, Anna, I'm not happy as an international teacher right now, and I don't know why. I cannot pinpoint it. It's like crying in my Lamborghini. You know, why am I not feeling completely fulfilled in this lifestyle when it's all I ever wanted? So that's another trend that I have see quite a bit as well all my work is at the moment is with one-to-one clients and online and i'm also actually building group programs for these trends right building workshops for teachers that are suffering burnout and a lot of that just involves teaching strategies around it because how i got started in this before i started working with the international teachers specifically was that i was working in corporate well-being and I still am. I do work in corporate well-being where I give workshops and well-being workshops um, and work with leaders on their leadership skills for how they deal with managing people. So I was I, I like to it's such a broad umbrella of so many different things that I'm doing at the moment. But the easiest way for me to kind of describe it is that I work on people development. Right. I am that accountability partner when you need it. I am the partner that helps you when you need clarity or you need guidance or you need to build strategies or advice on what to do next. And as a psychologist, everything that I do is evidence-based. Well, that's important if it's evidence-based because your background, your training, your education, together with your experience overseas teaching and all of your experience with corporate world, it really gives you the background that you can help people and reach out. Of course, it's going to be international and it's going to be online because you have to set things up and you can't meet face to face. Mm -hmm. That's a joy because you're going to reach out to people all over the world as international teachers and they have all different home countries. I'm going to go off and say, in my mind, it sounds like if I set up something with you and we get to know each other, that you are a sounding board 
you are a confidant. You're also going to be very safe because I don't know you as an individual. I've never met you. No one else knows you in my sphere of of influence or where I live. Here I am talking to a stranger. It's sort of like going in and sitting down on your couch, right? It might be a virtual couch, but I'm not going to see a psychologist. I, I have something wrong with me. It's more like I need a safe place to go. Is that fair enough to say? Yes, absolutely. And then the part that I would add on to that is that it's always purposeful and goal oriented in essence or action oriented. Because it's evidence It is. And you have the experience to back that up. So if I come to you and we, you start to investigate and inquire with me to delve deeper into what's making me tick and what's, what's getting in the way, what are the hurdles that I might have, and then you can research more based on what we discuss and plan out actionable things that, we can t- that I can try as, as one of your clients, right? Exactly. That's awesome because I can't go home and go to an appointment. You know, I may, I may not see somebody. I might not be able to bounce my ideas off somebody, and I feel lost, and I can reach out to somebody. That's what you're offering, it sounds like. Yeah, that's exactly it because it's – Somebody, well, I'm, I'm someone, as an international teacher, I understand these hurdles and I understand the frustrations and I understand what international teacher life is like. So there's that element of it. But also at different times throughout our lives, we struggle and that's okay. And we need to have somewhere to get help and we need to have somewhere to go to and someone to talk to for clarity and just being able to figure stuff out. Um, just being able to carve and I'm using a lot of metaphors <laughs> to carve our way through the weeds to figure out okay but what is it that I actually want there's several people that I'm working with at the moment who are stuck in contracts that they're not happy in and that can be a very desperate situation in some regards because you you know as an international teacher if you break contract yeah, it's held against you yeah Absolutely. And you have nowhere to go. You know, what do I do next? I had that in Egypt and I had no one to talk to and I was stuck. And the thing, the most important part of it is in, I would say you'll probably, you probably see this more than anything is that there is no one to talk to that can relate. We went back to the idea of relating. I could call my mom and I could cry on the phone and I could work my way through my feelings. And my mom is going to be like, you can do it, Craig, but she's not going to have a clue how to go about tackling and deciding what my next move is. It sounds like you're definitely the person that can get through that. You've talked with a lot of people. I have too. More than anything, I'm just a good listener. I think the difference between us is that you're a good listener, but you're also actionable and evidence-based and a trained psychologist to handle situations, but more specifically with the international teaching field. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. God, where were you back in 2004 when I was going through hell in <laughs> Egypt trying to get out of there? I, could, I mean, in mm-hmm. the dead of night, and I, I don't mind talking about this because it was not the right fit, and my friends make fun of me for that, but the school was not the right fit, and halfway through the year, I said, I'm going to break if I don't leave. It's an absolute, I have to make this decision to leave, and under the cover of night, I'm, I'm faxing back in the day. I was faxing out information. I was emailing, trying to talk. I couldn't talk to anybody. Not even my roommate could know that I was going to leave because some of these schools have very strict contracts. If they find out you're going to leave, they take away your pay. They, they'll take away your airline ticket home. They'll just kick you right out and you're gone or you, they won't let you leave. Right. And that's scary. And to, to find somebody else that knows what to do, how do you, who do you talk to? It sounds like you're in a, you're a 911 call for international <laughs> teachers more than anything. <laughs> I, I wish you had been there for me during my Egypt transition. I, I think back, I directly think back to 2004 and when that happened to me. And I, I wish, I wish I had had someone to talk to. You must, you must have a wonderful, uh, you must have a, a lot of clients potentially that that don't know where you are can you tell us how to get in touch with you so we can just like right away people can write it down yeah absolutely my website is currently under development but i'll give you my email address is the easiest at the moment it's a direct line to me so you can get in touch with me at anna at enhancedwellbeing.org 
And we'll put that in the notes, of course. We always say that, and we do. I love that. So they can directly contact you, and they can vet you maybe through some emails, maybe with a – do you do a conference to start or like a – Oh, yeah. Oh, and work? I think that's really, really important at the beginning because you have to know that not only me but myself and the client that we're the right fit for each other. So I always do what I call a free discovery call, and it's just an opportunity for us to meet online – talk about where they are, potentially ask me some questions because it's really important that there is that level of trust that they know about me and they can figure out whatever they want um, about me from the beginning. So your process sort of right now, while your website's being built up, your your process is for them to reach out on email and say, hey, I'd like to just talk. And you initially just agree to a first time where you get to trust each other, you build some trust between you, you start a relationship, they can decide whether or not they want to move forward. Exactly. That's exactly it. And it's because it's so varied in the different people that I work with. It is so varied and people come to me for so diff- so many different reasons. And it's I love what you were saying there about trying to find somebody to talk to have having that person that confidant because I found I found that when I was working in education I was that person even those times you know where there was kind of ethical dilemmas of you know I'm in leadership in the school but a staff member that I worked with needed off the record advice on what to do um in certain situations they still came to you and they're like and, we yeah. need to talk to Anna yeah and that's it was my process for doing that that I always wanted to formalize and go, okay. And I love being that support for, for staff and for individuals and going, it's okay. It's not, you know, not, it's not, everything's not lost here. There are always options and we can figure this out and I've got your back. I'm, I love it because now when people come to me, I'm just going to give them an, I'm going to give them your email address because people love to, to just talk to me because I'm a safe uh, source of listener. I listen and I don't always give advice and I just say, I'm listening sometimes. And I've learned that about women, especially they just want to tell somebody something without anybody fixing it. I'm, it takes me a long time to learn that. The the key point here is that you've formalized it now. How long have you been doing this formally? Um, I've been doing it formally for about 18 months. Um, the work that I've been doing with educators and that is probably only over the last nine months or so. I actually had a little boy this time last year. He's about to turn one. Um, so that slowed things down in one regard for me. And I was you doing had a, a child, you mean corporate work. You had yeah. your first. Oh, I'm sorry. Congratulations. I, I was trying to say like, people are like, Greg, do you have kids? I'm like, yeah, I have like 30. And they're like, what? <laughs> so you mean you have your own child that, that's now one? Yes. I had um, had my son this time last year. So with that, sorry, I'm going off on a tangent here, but I was working, doing a lot of work with um, corporate clients and corporate organizations back in Europe and the States running workshops for them and doing the coaching and work their staff and leadership one-to-one but I always wanted to get back to teachers and I've always wanted to help teachers because obviously like I said my husband is an international school teacher I've been in that situation and had my own well-being affected and very much felt that nobody nobody gets how I'm feeling right now you're making me very confident in your ability because the reason you have only been doing a little bit with international teaching is because this is where your goal is to get Mm -hmm. out and to put your shingle out into something that nobody else really does. I've never heard of it. No, I've never heard anybody else talk about it. There's no support system. Maybe just at your school, you can talk to somebody. It sounds like you have this vast experience already with corporate. And why wouldn't you, if you had a child, you can't just start a new business or start a new practice. You can't start your own practice focused on something that you haven't done before if you have a child all of a sudden in your life and you're going through, you're living somewhere else. You fell back on the corporate world to do your support while you were raising your your one-year-old. And now you're slowly getting into your focus, which is for us 
as a service to be here for all of us that went through something you went through. And that's coming to my question. So it sounds like you had an experience where you needed exactly what you're doing now. Yeah, that's exactly it. I had, at the time I called it almost like an existential crisis or... Mid-teaching crisis. <laughs> a, mid, a mid-teaching crisis. I was in the process of turning 30 as well. So I was like, is it a, like a turning 30 crisis? Um, but I just felt really unfulfilled in the job that I was doing. And it, and again, even when I talked to other teachers, I felt, other international teachers, I felt that it, it was hard to be kind of understood or my perspective to be understood because I felt that I wasn't being challenged or stimulated in the way that I wanted necessarily. But when I would talk to other teachers about it, they're like, what are you, what are you talking about? Like, this is such a hard job. This is, I was like, yes, it, it is. But there's just something misaligned here for me. They couldn't direct your conversation in a, they couldn't help you identify it. You weren't able to really get anything out of it except for them just listening and going, oh, I feel bad for you. You'll work it out. They weren't helping you yeah. direct a solution for yourself. Like not give you a solution, but direct you towards what you're looking for. Exactly. And because the thing is, is that the answer wasn't out there in the ether. The answer was within me. But I had nobody to help guide that process of through my own self-discovery and my own self-awareness of figuring this out. So I ended up quitting and I took I took a sabbatical for a year. And when I first went into my principal to tell her, she started laughing. She thought I was joking. She was like, but Annie, you can't leave me. It's like, I need to. I need to. And this is just, I need to step away from this for a little while and just figure out where I am, um, what I want to do, um, where is... What's this itch that I need to scratch? I don't, I can't find the itch right now. And like, I knew I, I got into teaching because I wanted to go down the psychology path with it. Then of course, you know, the traveling happened in between and it was just gaining clarity and getting back to that was a huge part of it. But I, yes, I felt very under, misunderstood Um and there was nobody there to just help guide me and go through it again because it wasn't anything clinical. So you don't go for counselling or go to see a psychologist because you think something's just not right. Something's not clicking for me. So I look, and here I go off on a tangent again. But if you look at psychology, okay, imagine a scale of like minus 10 to plus 10. Minus 10 to zero is your clinical kind of area. You're suffering from mental illness. Okay? You have either anxiety or depression or psychosis or whatever. And this is an area that you get treatment for and you recover from and you repair. Okay, But then you have the area that's zero to plus 10. And in essence, if you think about that, that's your flourishing life. That's life at your best. That's you thriving. That's you at your strongest and you're optimized. And to be able to work in this zero to plus 10 area, it's, it's difficult to find people that will work within that area or help you to be at your best. Because there's nothing wrong with you. Right? You're exactly. not in that zero to it's negative like, well, what are we 10. Fixing? The medicated, the diagnosed, the, ner- the nature, if you will. Yeah. It's more like the nurture. Yeah. It's like that plus zero to plus 10 is a nurture area. And the, I mean, of course, it, they're both affecting, or the, both nurture and nature affect you. But you're in that positive section. You're like, there's nothing wrong with you. And the average person's mm-hmm. going to say, hey, what, what are you talking about? You're fine. You got money, you're traveling, you got a husband, you got a one-year-old, you're just fine. But that that zero to plus 10 is that area that it's hard to identify, right, is what you're saying. And as a psychologist, as an international teacher, you're going to be able to identify and gear them towards and coach. Not even, I hate to say the word coach. Do you know that? Because there's so many people that are coaches these days. It's the new phrase. It's the new job. Absolutely. Do you, yeah. see, do you think that's the same thing with, and I oh, think, I feel like people everywhere. are leaving teaching and ever since COVID, everyone's a coach now. 
a life coach, a pet coach, I mean, a podcast coach. I mean, everyone's a coach of something. Where they all pop up from? Huh, interesting. Yeah. Well, you're working it, in that. It, I'm sorry, I took away from your tangent. You're working <laughs> in that, that zero to plus 10. Exactly. That's where it's optimizing your skills, your performance, your opportunities. It's strengthening what you have already so that you can thrive and flourish. And because, as, as you guys say, international education is the best kept secret in education. It is, if you want to be a teacher, really it's the best way to do it because you have so many of your other basic needs met and you have so many more opportunities to it. So, and this was the the catalyst in essence for me of look at me I have this incredible life with international teaching and as an international educator but I still feel like I'm missing something and that's I'm you going still through not, it yeah that was you yeah. going through this moment or this time period not a moment wow exactly and it got to the point of okay well do I risk losing all of this? Do I risk losing all of these fantastic parts of being an international teacher just to go and delve a bit deeper in and see what this is that I'm looking for? What is this itch that I personally need to scratch? And to me, I got to the stage of, yes, I had to. I put it off for so long. It's like, don't be ridiculous, Anna. You have a great life. What more could I ask for in essence? You know I, fantastic husband we were happily married um we are happily married still um you know we lived in a gorgeous apartment we traveled we'd seen so much of the world I was kept looking going every one of my boxes is being ticked but yet there's something and that was where I had to go through that process of self-discovery and inquiry to get there and now I know and I understand from going back and studying the psychology, I understand exactly what was going on with me in that moment. It's called the hedonic treadmill. Have you ever heard of it? I haven't. No, this is good for me. Right. So the hedonic treadmill is when you get caught in this cycle of hedonic moments or pleasure. So hedonia is pleasure, joy. And basically... Whatever your baseline of your well-being or happiness is, okay, your baseline, it's very difficult to change it without purposeful, purposefully um, trying to impact it. But with the hedonic treadmill, I have my hands out in front it's of Graham okay. to explain okay. this, so I wonder if it'll come across on air. But with the hedonic treadmill, you're chasing a high, you're chasing a joy. So for instance, it could be, and how many teachers do this? Just get to the next holiday. I'll survive this term, just get me to the next holiday. You go on holiday, you have a boost in joy, you go back to term time and it drops. And then you get caught on it again. All right, you chase the next high of joy and that next joyful hit. You're like, I'm fine, I'm fine, bang. But all the time you're coming back to your baseline of happiness. So if you do not spend time working on your baseline and you work on your baseline by bringing fulfillment to your life, by um, optimizing your experiences and your personal and characteristic strengths, by bringing fulfillment. You need to do almost like a needs assessment of all aspects and all dimensions of well-being within your life. And you, it's like you getting to the root of the problem rather than just dealing with the symptoms. All right, let's take a moment for a little commercial about how to get in touch with us. You can, of course, find all four of us at the itpexpat.com. That's www.itpexpat.com. Or you could also find us at email at internationalteacherpodcast at gmail.com. We look forward to hearing from you. Or if you're into Facebook, we have a new Facebook group at www.facebook.com slash groups slash ITP expat, where you can find all kinds of inside information about ITP expat. You can also find us on Instagram at ITP expats. That's with an S, ITP 
X Pats is our handle. All right. And thank you, listeners. We have over a hundred countries represented by our listeners. And though we're not monetized, we are here for you. And we would like to thank all of you for listening. So let's get back to the show. Yeah, I feel like I'm on that treadmill right now. And this is not my my session here, but I'm relating to this. <laughs> and I think it's interesting because I am at the top of my game right now, I feel. And I, I know that there's reasons that I'm not feeling happy. But on the other hand, I found a joy that gets me through the unhappiness. I found a new joy. I've found a couple of new joys. That, and podcasting is one of them. It keeps me going in those times that I don't, you know, I don't feel like I want to do what, what I normally do. And I might be in a little bit of a, a rut, but that brings me out. So I guess I'm just lucky because not everyone's going to have that. There's a, this can be a deep spiral. This, this kind of a, even if you use the word depression and there's teachers that reach that point and that confusion point, like you were at in questioning what you're doing. And there's a lot of teachers that'll leave the, the field, that'll leave the international, they'll go back home, they call it quits, they'll go back to their home country, go back to family and say it's going to be all better. And yet it, it probably isn't because you're, they haven't gotten to the root of it is what you're saying. And that it's exactly. not the international, it's not the situation necessarily that they're in. It might be a bunch of factors, which is what you can help investigate and find out. Exactly. And also, not only just find out and investigate, but then how do you fulfill that? Action. How do you change that? Exactly. How do you change that? So, for instance, um, a client that I'm working with at the moment, they're working through the transition of moving to a new place and a new, um, a new contract in a new school. So we're working through the transition period of that, of finishing up in the country that they are and setting up their foundations for positive well-being when they arrive to their new place in July, August time. But we actually started this last September. I started working with them in last se- September um, where we did a needs assessment of why they wanted to move and what they were looking for for their next job. And that might sound simple. You go, well, I want like this amount of money or I want more money or I want um, a sunny place. But you need to delve deeper into that. What is happening in your current situation that is not fulfilling you or meeting everything that you need right now? And say, we'll do things like tap into Maslow's hierarchy. Do you know Maslow's hierarchy? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what are the basic needs for you? What are your... Um, physiological needs because they are can be slightly different for everyone okay um even your social needs what are your social needs and how will you fulfill them like are they being met and if they're not how can we change this because that's going to follow for example that's going to follow your your client through to the next school it's just going to happen again like you were saying it's a treadmill it's like a hamster wheel if you don't identify that, that same thing will happen again, and it might be even worse because of the situation that you're in in your next school. Exactly. You're trying to identify this overall. You're trying to really help. And that's why you're saying it didn't just start right when they started looking. It was before that, right? That's, yeah. It sounds like you have a, a good journey with, with your clients. It sounds like there is a a lot of commitment on your part to work them through because it's not something you can figure out right away. What, what, yeah, a, it's not, what a resource you are. I mean, that guy must be like, Oh, well, praise God. Look, thank you so much. Emma. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I find it so gratifying as well to see someone come out of that rush that they're stuck in okay, and go, okay, we're making traction on this where you have clarity on it and things like, this guy was really struggling to write his CV and cover letter or update it. Um, you know how, say, I think the search associates that he was with, but they you write like a bio on your search associates profile. He was like, I've had the same thing for the last five years and it's not really me. I don't know what to write in it. But because we had gone through this deep discovery and... Um, bringing self-awareness to what it was he 
he wanted and what was at the essence of him as a teacher. The next thing he had the bio written in a couple of days and he's like, I, now I know I have that clarity. I know what I'm looking for. I want to be authentic in this because I want to make sure that my next move is the right one because I've made mistakes. Yeah, it wasn't the CV. It wasn't that cover letter that he was stuck on. It was much mm-hmm. deeper, right? It mm-hmm. was much deeper because we can offer resources for you know fixing things like our CV, but it sounds like it sounds like it was much deeper than that. And you delved into that with him to try and find out what the source of the whole anxiety was, huh? Exactly. Yeah. You guys, you, you psychologists are just amazing. I've never seen a psychologist before. I'm, I mean, I've seen you now, but I haven't gone <laughs> in and talked to anybody before. That I know of. I'm, I'm sure my friend David would be like, every time we're sitting around the campfire, Greg, I'm doing a psychology session with you. <laughs> what I'm always amazed with now is that as soon as I say I'm a psychologist, I get, you get like two different types of people. One, the large majority just clam up and they're like, I'm not saying anything more. She must be reading my mind. Really? You get that kind of uh, effect off of people, huh? And they're like, oh, yeah, I don't want to then, call her and talk to her because she's going to, you know, she, I have, I don't have anything wrong with me. Why do I need to talk to her? I'm fine. Ex- exactly. That's exactly it. Um, but that's a hurdle. Even, that's a stop sign right there because that's that's like full stop. I, I don't need your help because I don't, there's nothing wrong with me. That's got to yeah. be difficult to overcome that. And that initial talk with them, I'm sure the initial meet and greet is is very difficult to have them even think about it. And you probably don't hear back from them for a while. In most cases, they're probably thinking about it and come back to the fact that, no, I felt really comfortable talking to you, but there's nothing wrong with me. I'm going to call her anyway, right? I can just see that happening. It's kind of, if you think about like a personal trainer or working on your fitness, you don't have to wait until your fitness is absolutely on the ground. You don't have to wait until there's something wrong with it. You don't have to wait to strengthen your body you don't have to wait until it's at its weakest point instead if you are proactive and positive about it and you are strengthening strengthening it when it's at a decent enough level then you're going to make it even stronger and more resilient when it comes to the tough times and yet the example that you're using is very easy to identify i know that i am i need to to do something now before it's too late (laughs) I know it because it's physically, I can see it, I can feel it. But I tell you what's interesting yeah. is that in your line of work and in what your niche is the fact that first it has to, you have to identify some of these things that are hurdles and the, the gaps that you have. I don't want to say, you know, the things that are wrong with the, the health or whatever, because it's not a diagnosis that way. But you do need to delve deep into what is it that has to change. And identifying it and talking about it, it must be amazing because they'll be like, you know, I never thought about it that way before. Do people say that to you a lot? Like, oh, I never oh, thought all about the time. it that way. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah, all the time. Yeah, you're gone. The one I get a lot is, huh. And that's the, oh, yeah, I, I never thought about it like that. Or that's just clicked with me. And sometimes as an outside perspective, I can go, yeah, I can I can see that almost from the beginning, but until it clicks for the individual, until you have are more until you're aware of it yourself, you're never going to act on it. So awareness is the foundation of any kind of change or progress. Okay. That sounds very Anything elementary, but I didn't do. think of it that way. I mean, I didn't say those mm-hmm. words. It's good that you said that. Identifying and knowing it what it is, right? That's the only way to to solve any problem is to know what the problem is. Exactly. Huh. Exactly. And which is, sounds like easier said than done. Because, you know, if you ask them, well, what's wrong? <laughs> oh, hell no. I'm not going to be like, well, well I don't know. know. This happened or this happened. Because <laughs> you said that before. They're in that situation normally where, oh, what's wrong with me? They're, what's wrong? Why am I not happy in my school right now? I like this. I like this. I like this. These things are happening. Everything else is good. I just don't feel right. Going back to your situation that this idea was born from is like you got to that point where you just didn't have anybody to talk to and no one to relate to what you're doing and no one to help you actually just like define or or put words to feelings that you're having. Mm -hmm. Wow. Or even just to give me a space to go, okay, well, how do we figure this out? 
you know, having a process or a space to be able to do it. That wasn't there. And without anybody finding out because I'm worried because it's it's me and I don't want people to I don't want people to get the wrong idea. I can't talk to my admin about it. I can't talk to my counselor about it. They're going to tell somebody else in my school. I can't tell them at home because there's no one to go to. They don't sympathize or empathize with my situation because they don't understand it. Exactly. Yeah. I think you've hit the goal mine here as far as like an opportunity to help people. People are going to find out about this. I know because I'm not going to stop talking about it. <laughs> I'm going to be like, well, I know thanks, exactly <laughs> who you need to talk to. Oh my gosh. I, I think it's going to be, it's going to be sort of like our family of information from our secret is that we want to press the word out that here's what we do for a living and here's why it's so cool. And yet let's be realistic about this. It's not for everybody and people bring problems with them. They may not have any problems, but problems arise and feelings arise and we can't always talk about it because we can't identify it. So what are the signs that, can you, here we go, let's, how do I say this? What are some signs that I might say, I'm going to call or I need to reach out to Anna and just talk about something? What would be some signs for a teacher that's in a situation, and there's so many you said, but are there some identifiable situations that they should call you or reach out to you that you could help with? I think if you're feeling any kind of lethargy around your day-to-day, if you're exacerbated by your school day, if you're not enthusiastic about it, if you feel like you are just living for the weekends, living for the holidays, and thinking, I'm just going to stay in this job because it pays well and I'm putting into my retirement fund and it will all be fine in the next 10 years because then I'll retire and I'll have my pot of money. If you are not feeling fully fulfilled in your work and your life as an international educator, you need to act on it. You need to start looking at your life, looking at your work and asking questions, thinking about potential changes you could make, get get into why am I not fully happy or why am I not fully engaged in this? If you feel like you're in survival mode, if you're living towards for the weekends, if you're living for the holidays, if you're just trying to push through all the time, then you need to take action on it. Because while it might just be feeling a bit at the moment, you keep going like that, it's going to end up in teacher burnout And then mental illness, depression comes out of these issues so many times as well. Um, The term languishing got very popular during COVID and everyone got more familiar with the term languishing. It's kind of between your feeling good and normal, quote unquote, to feeling depressed. There's this space in between um, where you can describe it as just feeling a bit bit meh, a bit unenthusiastic. And if you're hanging out in that space now, you're going to end up in depression. While languishing is not a mental illness, it can lead to uh, feelings of bleakness, burnout, like I said, depression. And this is where then people do things like quit the best job they've ever had or quit international teaching and do something dramatic um, or just decide to completely leave it altogether. I guess what I enjoy about this conversation is that I just met you, but you are evidence-based. You are trained in psychology. You have worked with patients or clients for many years, and you have a lot of experience, as well as being specifically for international teaching is where you're heading. What I enjoy about this the most is that, going back to that word life coach. (laughs) I know, right? That word, I'm like... That's somebody that says that they can help you, but they don't have any education to back it up. They might have some experience, but they don't have their personal experience and the history of already working in the field to back that up, which you do. You have all, you tick off all those boxes. You've trained in psychology. You're accredited for that. You have the experience. You had your own episode, which sort of said, it's like, here we go. I know what I need to do. I need to provide something that was never provided for me. 
and then you also have all the experience and the education. So I think that's just a phenomenal package that you offer as far as what's to come. Like, I can't wait to see how this builds up and how your practice grows and, and, and blossoms because there's a lot of us out there. There's a lot of listeners out there. There's a lot of teachers out there, and we're, we just don't know about you yet. And now we're just getting a glimpse of this. I'm glad you came on the show to sort of like in the beginning, right, as you're growing this practice that you have. There's a thousand <laughs> questions. I don't want to feel like I'm on the couch, though. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I think we need to have Kent on here just so that he could, like, open up and get through some of his issues. <laughs> He's going to kill me for saying that. <laughs> I'm going off topic here a little bit, but I went back to Ireland with a couple of teachers. It was a wonderful five-day trip, and it's one of those things that you said you live for your vacations. But I feel like I'm sort of living vacation to vacation. Is that is that not normal? I feel it's a little bit normal. When I was teaching, the first thing I did on the first day of school was open my diary. Well, back, you know, when I started 10, 12 years ago, when it was physical diaries, and go and highlight all of the holidays for the rest of the year. Thank do God you, I'm normal. Do do okay, that? so good. We're talking, <laughs> yeah. that's normal. I guess what I'm getting at is it goes back to the idea of like, when do I need to reach out and, and find some help? Because it's, you know, it's hard to identify. I guess it's normal if, if it's that lethargy is what you really mentioned. And that's what grabbed me. I'm getting at the, what I got out of what you were saying before is that it's the lethargy part and it's that wheel that you feel on. You're not enjoying your passion, which is teaching. You're not enjoying the kids. You're not smiling at all during the day after you've been helping to educate. Yeah. That sounds like when it's time to say, hey, I need someone to talk to. I want to go back to Ireland and I can't wait. So I'm trying to mark my calendar. I'm looking like two years ahead. Where should I go next? Right. I've been to Sri Lanka. I want to. Where have you traveled? Can you give us let's talk a little bit about you, because I'm totally comfortable with your practice coming up. And I know we're going to get a lot of people that are reaching out to you. Tell us a little bit more about you personally like where you've been and some travel stuff. So my husband and I, we're big into scuba diving and we spend a lot of our holidays when we were teaching scuba diving. We've been to Sipadan, which is, if any of your listeners are scuba divers, you have to dive Sipadan. It is phenomenal. We've traveled New Zealand, Australia, so much of Asia, kind of lost <laughs> lost count of how many different countries we've been to at this stage. Um, we've climbed in Nepal. We've been to India. Um, we actually had our honeymoon here in Sri Lanka well, back in 2018 before we never thinking we'd ever live here. Um, so we were, we've done that. What else have we done? Actually, do you know what? You sent me a question that I had a story for. Um, about police incidents. Oh, you have a police story. It was in China. So we were, I'm trying to think, was it 2000 and, 2014, we first went international and we moved to China. We were so green. Like we were so inexperienced. We'd barely even been anywhere on holiday before that. Um, so we moved to China and the school that we were uh, working in had put us into an apartment you know they had organized an apartment for us that was going to be our apartment for the year there was an agent that hooked us up and as much and all as we tried before we left London to go to China we didn't have a word of Chinese between us so we're there about two weeks and then get a knock at the classroom I was in the middle of teaching a lesson and I get a knock at the classroom um, from the school secretary who's like, very bluntly, you need to grab your passport and get to the school office now. I was like, okay, um, can I just finish up the, cla- the class? And they're like, no, right now. now. It's like, okay, what have we done? And I'm walking down the corridor and then I see my husband, David, coming down the corridor as well. I was like, you too? What's going on? We get, nobody's explained it to us. We get bundled into a van and brought to the local police station. And as we're getting out of the van, somebody else meets us and they're like, there's been a mix up with your residence permits. You never you never registered when you arrived in the country. So anyone who's been to China, either as a tourist or for working there, 
within 72 hours of arriving in the country, you have to go and register with the local police st- at the local police station. Obviously, we didn't realize this. We didn't know it. And if we had checked into hot- a hotel, the hotel would have done it automatically for us. Right. So we get bundled into the police station. There's the head inspector, or head captain, or the biggest knob in there, like the biggest <laughs> guy in there comes down, the head honcho, that's the word term I'm right. looking for. The head honcho comes down and um, starts roaring at us in Chinese, bundles us into a room and tells us that we're going to go to jail because we haven't registered and literally took a law book off the shelf and threw it at us. <laughs> he threw a book at you? He literally threw the book at us. And <laughs> he's like, you're going to go to jail. Da, da, da. And this went on. We must have been in that office for about an hour. And he's shouting at us. And then the only word we're catching in English is prison, jail. It's like, what are we going to do? And then he brought it down to that we needed to pay a $10,000 fine. Like 10000 US dollar fine. And the person from the school starts like nodding her head. And then she turns to us and said, you'll just have to pay the $10,000 fine. It's like, no, absolutely no way. I don't even have $10,000. Like we had just come from London with two pennies in our pockets. I was like, no, no. So anyway, we kicked up a fuss. We're asked to remove ourselves from the office for a minute. Then went back in. Saw a brown paper envelope sitting on the guy's desk. So I'm sure you can imagine what was in that. Um, And then he said that he would, because he was a nice guy, he was going to let us off with a warning just this time. But we had to write a letter to the state, to the People's Republic of China, vowing that we would never break another law for the entire time we were in China and that we were so deeply sorry (laughs) that we always would respect China, the police and its laws and sign it and hand it over. I still have a picture of that letter because it was such a ridiculous situation. (laughs) Oh my, I'm just speechless. I've never, this is why we do police stories on, on here because that is just, I can't even, I mean, the minute you said prison, I was just dumbfounded. I was like, oh my God. (laughs) <laughs> and then the yeah. minute you said ten thousand dollar fine, you're like, T- excuse me, like ten thousand, not dong, not Vietnamese dong or something. That's like two dollars, yeah. but ten thousand U.S. dollars. Like looking back, do you think it was some kind of a scam? Do you think it was just? Uh, I, I mean, do you have any idea what it was? I I think it was purely opportunistic on um, the cops. On that knob. Uh, point of view. <laughs> yeah, on that knob. <laughs> on the head honcho. He saw these two coming in. And he's like, okay, I have them here. Um, because we had heard when we were first told what was going on by the person in the school, they're like, it's not a big deal. We just, we have to present you guys and, you know, say that you're okay and that, and say sorry. But the fact it escalated into this, we were going to prison, and then a $10,000 fine. Oh, and then we were going to be deported. Um, and then just obviously a little envelope of money went across the table at some point and all was forgiven. Oh my Just pure God. ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> you just barely by a hair, you barely like got out of Chinese jail, prison. Yeah. Oh my Lord. Yeah. Thank I imagine. you for sharing that story. I, I'm just, I'm <laughs> still just dumbstruck. I can't yeah. believe that. I believe it. I mean, I'm just, uh, it's hard to really, wow. Yeah, it was ridiculous. But I I think back, I can think back now and laugh, but we were so scared at the time. We, you know, had just arrived in this new country that we didn't understand. We'd left two permanent jobs in London and it completely like rocked the foundation for us from from the beginning. So yeah, now we sit back and laugh and we still have a picture of that letter framed in the house. <laughs> oh, I would too. Yes. Yeah. So I have a yeah. question for you. Did Were you, maybe I wasn't listening enough, but when you had arrived and you were in China, had you already reached out to the school 
Because obviously it doesn't sound like the school was reaching out and like protecting you from this. You couldn't call to somebody from the school and say, hey, we're at the jail right now. You need to come interpret for us, et cetera. Or did the school help you out? So it had turned out, basically the agent that the school, the housing agent was the one who screwed up. But because uh, it was an outside the, source, okay. Yeah, but because the school was in charge of the housing and put us into the house and bypassed us going to a hotel, they were responsible in essence as well. But um, that first school that we went to when we first arrived in China wasn't very people first. <laughs> if that's the way to. Um, right, not it. every school is, right? They're all yeah. different flavors of schools. Yeah, and so we, I mean, it was a, the whole process, the couple of years that we spent in that school was a very, very steep learning curve. And we soon lost our green greenness. I don't know if that's an Irish term when you say somebody's very green. Um, we were very Isn't everything green in Ireland? <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Um what I mean is that we were very naive and we learned very quickly that we had to double check everything. We couldn't be trusting. Um, so our trust was rocked in that school from that first instance and right. was never rebuilt. It was just damaged more. As you, you said earlier on about your friend with the, a duck, like pecking away our trust was cracked in that moment and it right somebody took a sledgehammer to it over the next two years right and then you Mm. you got out of that situation and went for a different school and of course from then on you were much more experienced in this so you had your flags out you're like wait a minute what is the onboarding process i need to know what the school does how is how are we protected you might even bring up questions like uh, does the school support us? Do they have connections? What happens if we run into some kind of a problem with school, et cetera? I mean, I, there's a lot of stories about that, and that's so scary. You don't mm-hmm. want to be on some you know, special show about being locked up overseas. I think there's a show about that. Yeah, right? banged I mean, up abroad. joke Isn't about it? it. Yeah. Yeah. We can joke about it, but that is scary. And that, I've always told people that I choose schools as best I can that I feel comfortable with that I'm going over to another country and they're going to be my comfort zone. They're going to step in and take care of something that is political or something that is, that comes up that you cannot plan. And that is just a horror story that you two are sitting there in a police station. Like, what do we do next? Who do you call? You guys must've been sitting there. Like, who do we call? Yeah, exactly. We're did, like, how did they we separate you? This? No, they kept us together, thankfully, yeah. Oh, and, my Lord, um, that would have been the scariest thing ever, right? Yeah, yeah. And we both kind of had to have a moment together of neither of us can flip out right now. Neither of us can get angry from the fear and, and snap because we have no idea of our rights here, or who's done, who has done the right thing or the wrong thing. The very, very steep learning curve. But it's important there what you say, with international schools, they're responsible, in essence, for more than just your job. They're in, yep. in responsible for so many aspects of your safety, your security, um, because you're moving to a new place specifically for that school. So they have to meet more of your needs than just your employment. At least the best quality schools will. And that's a good question that comes up when you're looking at schools, right? You want to pick a school that you can have a discussion about this and say, listen, what about security? Does the school step in and secure, take care of security issues, government issues? If, if we're taken into the police station, can I call for some, you know, just for a misidentification? If, if somebody calls me in and they take me down to the police station, I need to know a number I can call right away that someone can back, back me up. I don't know what the language, I don't know the customs, I don't know the rules. And they know deeply because they're connected locally. So you want a school that steps in and do that. And that wasn't exactly. part of the yeah. plan for you guys when that first happened. Oh my no, God. No, it, wa- it wasn't, yeah. We had a, another situation here actually in Sri Lanka where we had 
um, in our first few months. And this is this just shows how the other end of the scale that a school can be so supportive. Okay, we had yeah. we had um, a hire car for the first few months that we were here, and we were trying to be responsible drivers. We knew we we had to be somewhere at a certain time, and then we were heading into town to meet people for dinner and drinks. So rather than taking the risk of, you know, driving into town and um, having a couple of drinks, we were like, okay, we won't do that. So let's leave the car in this car park, um, and then we will head off and we'll get a taxi into town and get a taxi home and we'll come back tomorrow. Yep. Right? Okay, trying to do the right thing. <laughs> we wake up the following morning to a call from the car rental company to tell us that the car has been towed. We're like, what? But like, we left it in a car park last night in a secure area. And we thought, we're like, what's the problem? Like, we don't know, but you need to go to the police station. It's been towed to this police station. So we go down. The police there were so nice and so helpful. We went in, explained what happened. We had left the car in a car park directly opposite the Parliament building. No sign or anything in the car park. But what we didn't realise is that it was a high security area and nobody was allowed to leave their vehicles there overnight. And he said it was potentially a security threat. And obviously... Um, what had happened in Sri Lanka back in 2019 with the Easter bombings, they are very, very big on security now. So it was obviously just, again, a lack of knowledge. It was ignorance on our part. We apologized to the policeman. He's like, don't worry, completely understand. You didn't know. He said Sri Lankans would know not to park there. Said, okay. He was like, all is forgiven. Don't worry about it. You just have to pay the tow fee. We can't get around that. Um, but give me an hour and you will have your car done and dusted. And I know that you guys made a genuine mistake here. And it was fantastic. But in that situation where we didn't know what was going on, and we there was a head of security at the school um, who's an ex-military guy. We rang him and he was fantastic. He came on the phone. And I, this was a Saturday. Came on the phone, talked to the policeman explained our situation and he was like okay don't worry about it I know this guy um this is just a misunderstanding we'll get it all cleared up for you and it was like oh you know you could breathe a sigh of relief so you're like I'm being we're being supported here and I don't mm-hmm. feel like we're on our own and I I feel like okay the school and the systems that the school has set up they have our back in this particular situation same thing we had a break in at the house and the same guy head of security, handled the whole thing. I was like 35 weeks pregnant and caught a guy in our bedroom <laughs> at two o'clock in the afternoon. First thing I did was ring the head of security at the school and he was here in five minutes. You go, okay, people have our, the school has our back. We feel that's the supported. kind of school you want to work for. You want to work Absolutely. for a school that's going to be there for you in the situation that is localized that you would have no clue to get out of. These things happen overseas. Right. And, and in summary, it's like we have these situations that happen, but we hopefully have our school that steps up and takes care of it and protects us from those things that are unforeseen. Because not everything is green. Not <laughs> to say your phrase, not everything yeah. is green. Right. Um, so I totally thank you for sharing your stories. I, I love the police stories when they come out okay. They're scary. <laughs> but all just wow, learning experiences. Uh, $10,000 $10, fine in Chinese jail. Oh, my Lord. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> or paying for a car that you just hired. You didn't even, you know, they take it away in somewhere else. You have no idea how to get it back. Wow. That's it. Yeah. How are we going to figure this out? But... But that's our life overseas, right? We live for the experiences. We live to be safe, and we tell the story later. We learn from the experiences and share it with others, and that's what the ITP is about. This is what our podcast is about, sharing stories. We don't want to tell everybody lies and say, oh, it's great over here. There's never any problem. But there are going to be problems, and I love to identify those and share them so other people can learn from us. You have a wealth of experience, and I, I can just imagine um, somebody co- coming on as one of your clients and being able to share from their heart 
what they they need to to sort of share with you and you can guide them through it share your stories along the way and say i identify with that you can empathize with what we're doing like no one else can so i'm so excited about this i would like to invite you back on at another time and maybe we'll visit in another year or so after your practice has come along but before we leave how about some final words some words of wisdom from anna so i would say the simplest thing to start and for anyone who's listening to this right now if you were to rate your life as an international teacher on a scale of one to ten right now what score would you give it? And then think about what is informing that score. What are the good things? What are maybe some things you feel are missing? So for instance, if you've given it a seven out of 10, now ask yourself, how can you raise it by one notch? It's not about getting to 10 out of 10 immediately, but what would raise it one notch? And what can you do about that? You're such a plus one person. I love it. <laughs> How can you take it to the next level of happiness? And if you're going in the wrong direction, I definitely need to reach out. And and I have someone to listen to now. I have someone that can, I can set up something with you initially with an email. I can reach out to you. You can meet with me online. We can decide what the next steps might be. And you give me time to think about it. And we can work everything out from there, correct? That's exactly it, yeah. It's always just asking questions like any inquiry, like most international education is just starting with some questions and setting the foundation with that. I've never had anybody like you on our show before, and it's it's a great resource to know that you're out there. Thank you so much for having me, Greg. It's been great chatting, and thank you for giving me a space to talk about what I do. On behalf of the ITP, we'll bring this to an end, and we'll just say if you're ever in China and you need to, you need you need to pay ten thousand dollars before you do, <laughs> reach out to Anna and her husband. They'll let you know how to get out of it. <laughs> Absolutely. 